Our guest today is the world's most powerful media owner, the chairman and chief executive news corporation, Rupert Murdoch. After inheriting just one Adelaide newspaper at the age of 22, he's gone on to build a global empire. News Corp now dominates the media landscape in the United States, Britain and Australia. Full disclosure, the company also owns one third of Sky News Australia. News Corp is also a major player online, but now Rupert Murdoch is taking a characteristic gamble. He wants to charge internet users to access content. The idea has split the industry, with the head of the ABC here in Australia calling it the classic play of an empire in decline. Rupert Murdoch, welcome. First explain to us why internet users who have enjoyed free content for years and years should suddenly have to pay. Well, they shouldn't have had it free all the time. <clears throat> I think we've been asleep. Uh, and, you know, it costs us a lot of money to put together good newspapers and good content. And, you know, they're very happy to pay for it when they buy a newspaper. And I think when they read it elsewhere, they're going to have to pay. Not huge sums. You'd be surprised <clears throat> at how, how much can be done, how cheaply, into the average home. But the problem is you're losing money at the moment online. No. Uh, how, how do you mean with our, with our, well, with is, our is websites? New, yeah, is news some websites are, some, yes, look, there are, I can tell you, there are no websites, news websites or blog websites uh, anywhere in the world uh, making any serious money. Some may be breaking even or making a couple of million. You've been particularly critical of uh, what you call the content kleptomaniacs and the plagiarists. Are you particularly talking about Google here? Well, uh, the people who just simply pick up everything and run with it uh, and steal our stories. Uh, we, we say they steal our stories, they just take them. Um, Is that Google? Without payment. Well, there's Google, there's Microsoft, there's um, Ask.com. Uh, there's a whole lot of people. Their argument is that they're directing traffic your way, that when someone goes to Google and punches in a topic, searches a topic and gets a link to a news website, uh, that's someone who wouldn't otherwise go to your website. That's right. So isn't it a two-way street? Aren't they no. helping you as much well, as they're well, What's the point of having someone come occasionally who likes a headline they see in Google uh, come to us? Sure, we go out and say, hey, we've got so many millions of visitors, we've better advertise and so on. The fact is, there's not enough advertising in the world to go around to make all the websites uh, uh, profitable. But isn't we'd it, rather have fewer people coming to our website but paying. Isn't it the job though once they hit your website to keep them there? It's got to be a good enough website for them to come back. <clears throat> yeah, but if they just search people, there's a subject and they find you know, 10, 20, 50 references to that subject on Google and they look through and they say, oh, that's an interesting headline, hit that. And it might be the Wall Street Journal, or it might be the Australian or the Daily Telegraph. Um, and when they click it, sure, they get the page or that story that's in our paper. But, you know, who knows who they are or where they are. Um, and um, it's not, uh, you know, they don't suddenly become loyal readers of our content. The other argument from Google is that you could choose not to be on their search engine, that you could simply uh, refuse to be on, so that when someone does do a search, your websites don't come up. Why haven't you done that? Well, I think we will. Uh, but that's when we start charging. We do it already with the Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> we, we have a wall, but it's not right to the ceiling. Um, you can get usually the first paragraph of any story, but then if you're not a paying subscriber, the Wall Street WSJ.com, there's immediately, or you, you get a paragraph and a subscription form. And is uh, this, this Wall Street Journal model what we can expect to see in your other uh, publications or websites? The uh, first paragraph free, but then you have to pay for it. Maybe, the maybe. There's a, there's a doctrine called fair use, which we believe could be challenged in the courts and barred altogether. Um, but, you know, it, it's okay. I mean, we're getting a lot of advertising mm -hmm. revenue, and so um, we will take that slowly. There are other models of doing this out there, aren't there? You can you can provide basic news free, analysis and commentary you can pay for, and then tailor 
you know, have a third tier where you tailor premium news content for the, the interests that a particular user would have. Is this the sort of... We put the whole lot together. We wouldn't try and distinguish because we think, you know, there's also in, in a newspaper, or we call a newspaper today, or a news service, there's a thing called editorial judgment. There's a thing called quality of writing, um, quality of reporting. And uh, just to say, you know, we'll take what's average stuff that comes from an agency uh, and not charge for that. Um, it's okay, but I think you're, you're really degrading the whole experience if you, if you do that. But one of the principles of the internet seems to be that anyone anywhere in the world can access information from anywhere in the world freely. Wouldn't this sort of change mean that for some people they're not going to be able to afford the sort of reliable information that they want? Everyone can afford a, a, a newspaper. They're the cheapest things in the world. Um, I think what you get in it. It's fabulous. Um, and um, it'll be even cheaper uh, when you get it uh, electronically. So it'll cost less than uh, a newspaper would? Oh, yes. Because the newspaper, well, there are two models. I mean, some people say charge the same or more, um, and it'll put the circulation of the paper up. But I think one's got to go with the flow and say, look, people like to read. Uh, news in a different form or whatever uh, and be able to access it. Um, now I think you, you've got to recognize we won't be using any paper, we won't be using any printing presses or any trucks, things like that, to produce, you know, uh, in, in getting this news to people in this way. Sounds from that like the hard copy newspaper is going to disappear. It may, uh, well, I don't think so, but not for 20 years anyway. Right. What about the comments? You know, it's somewhat of a generational thing. Yeah. It's hard to find people under 30 who buy newspapers. Yeah. Um, but people have been buying papers for 20 years. Uh, even bad newspapers, it's hard to see them. Uh, can't, can't stop buying all papers or even changing newspapers. As someone who loves the newspaper industry like you do, it might be 20 years down the track, but is that sad for you? That we're going to see the demise of, no, of the no, no, print no, edition? No, 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 The world moves on and changes. Now, I'm not saying they will go be gone in 20 years, uh, but you know, I, I love the news business um, and contacting, communicating with people. And I don't mind whether it's on television or whether it's on radio, whether it's in a newspaper or whether it's on the internet or some new form of over-the-air uh, transmission. Since 1953, when you took the helm of News Limited, you've no doubt seen a lot of changes. But is this the biggest change that you've seen, the shift to online? Oh, probably, but you know, we, we had a lot of things. Uh, in the late 50s, we had the arrival of television and the stripping, gradual stripping out of big national advertising going electronic. Um, it's limited and in fact eventually it caused newspapers to become almost monopolistic in every city. Papers could only, cities could only support one paper because it just wasn't the advertising uh, or so much of it had gone to other places. What about these comments from uh, Mark Scott, the head of the ABC? Uh, as I say, he, he says this is a classic play of old empire in decline. Well, I don't know. I'd never heard of him, but uh, someone asked me about this the other day, and then I saw a story today that he wants to spend eight hundred million dollars uh, putting Australian culture and didgeridoo all over the world. I mean, I it's, it's it's a huge overreach. There's not a, uh, there's not an audience for that. I think the ABC, um, <clears throat> you know, it's I'm not attacking it. I don't know enough about it. I tell you a lot about the BBC, which I think is a scandal. Uh, but what, why is that? Because everybody has a TV set is compelled to pay, uh, I think, 100 and, approximately 150 pounds a year. Uh, they have 4.6 billion <coughs> revenue, uh, and will go into any commercial enterprise where they see an opening. But I think public broadcasting should be of the highest quality, providing. Uh, 
programs and services to which commercial broadcasting can't afford to do, where there is a hole, and that's fine, and I don't mind, you know, some taxpayer support for that. Um, but when it comes to the online space, if you're charging for online content, and the BBC and the ABC are not, and they've made it clear they don't want to, of course not. Wait, they, they, they don't charge for it, they just charge the taxpayer. But isn't that going to be a but problem for your business the, model? They charge the taxpayer. But if people can get free, even if it is paid for through the taxpayer, free content online Well, if the taxpayer will them, pay me what they pay them, I won't charge, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but this is something you can't do anything about. No, but we're better. And at any rate, if you look at them, most of their stuff is stolen from the newspapers now. And we'll be suing them for copyright. Um, They'll have, to, they'll have to spend a lot more money on a lot more reporters to cover the world. Uh, That's your plan, when they to cover them legally? When they can't steal from newspapers. Okay, so you're going to take them on in the courts more aggressively? Yeah, I don't have to go to court. They, they, they know the law. They'll, 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 they'll adapt to that. It's like Google. Google's not going to... Uh, you can say now to Google, or, or, or to any of these people, take that down. Uh, they have... Uh, was that the vi great video site, which has been a huge runaway success. But it really started in the back of the reruns of people posting Simpsons and uh, Family Guy and mm. so on. And uh, we were wondered, you know, was this great publicity for us or was it in fact taking I mean, our audience? And in, I think in the end we said take them down and they were down the next morning. What about the, the YouTubes and other sites that do, you know, put clips of The Simpsons or other shows that that you guys are producing, uh, they're there for free for people to access and look at. Does that pose a threat to, uh, no, to, we to stop your business? Them. No, they, they, they'll, they don't even argue. You just, one telephone call, they'll take it off. Okay. But in general, does the internet pose any challenge uh, to the traditional TV yeah, well, and film You take industry? YouTube, um, in, in, a, in a sense, look, anything that uh, takes people's time and that they enjoy and you can have a lot of fun on YouTube, uh, a lot of laughs. Um, and you know, I guess that's com competition. Uh, those people could be watching a, a comedy on television or they could be uh, at a movie house or they could be in their armchair reading a newspaper. So yeah, everything is competition. If newspapers uh, are possibly going to disappear one day, what about television? What about cinema? Will people always want to sit back and watch the big screen? It looks like it. Uh, but, you know, there's also big screens coming out of people's homes. Mm. Um, you gotta, now you can get fantastic high definition 50-inch uh, screen. You'll be able to get bigger ones uh, in time. And in a couple of years, 3D on them, even. There's a big if appetite you have a pair for glasses too. and so on. Uh, so, <clears throat> and you'll have movies either off from your DVD or on demand from your broadband or whatever. Uh, and that's all competition. Uh, but that's why we make movies. Uh, we want to make the best movies and we want to make sure that we're paid for them when, when, people, when people look at them. That's all. And uh, so you know, there's a constant war uh, or vigilance now, put it this way, in the entertainment industry about piracy. And so far, I would say it's reasonably under control in most countries. Not every country, but most countries. Uh, and, I mean, look what happened to the music industry. Mm. Um, and interestingly, uh, the French government has just brought in a law that if you've got a website and you put down music without paying for it and they catch you at it, uh, the, the third time they catch you, you're, you've got to close your site and you can't come back on the internet. Uh, and there's a lot of movement to get that put in in America and become a world standard. But uh, because the music industry today, uh, it's very, very hard for young talent to get started and established. The delivery mechanism might be changing to uh, do online, but some things when it comes to the media uh, will always be there. And one of them is the, the love-hate relationship between the media and politicians. And there hasn't been a lot of 
love uh, lately between the, the White House and, uh, and Fox News, your Fox News in the United States. The White House communications director has described Fox News as the communications arm of the Republican Party, a political opponent, not a news outlet. What do you say to that? Oh, that's nonsense. And everybody knows it's nonsense. He's a very young, inexperienced guy. Barack uh, Obama. Hmm? Barack Obama, are you talking about? No, Mr. Gibbs, he's press secretary. Um, and uh, you know, they don't like criticism. Now, they admit publicly that our reporting of the White House and that our reporters in the White House are absolutely fair. And we have stated publicly and privately to them, you tell us whenever we make a mistake and we will correct it. It's a matter of fact. Uh, we do have, it's perfectly true, a couple of commentary shows in the evenings um, which tend to be uh, strongly critical. One comes at five at night, is new and has just become unbelievably popular, but it's a sort of libertarian f viewpoint this guy takes. Uh, he says, don't trust the government, don't trust me, just trust yourself. You know, it's pure libertarian sort of thing. But, um, and it struck a nerve. Uh, so, um, no, we're fine. And otherwise, you see other shows that are criticised. We have on Republicans and we have on Democrats and we have them debate. The other networks only have Democrats um, or something to the left of them. Uh, so in all honesty, um, you, you don't so, think Fox uh, News is... So we are the fair and balanced... No, I defend not, it no, absolutely. No bias on uh, Fox News at all? Not a, in its presentation of news, no. Mm. Do we have commentary shows uh, in the evening? Yes. Well, the Fox but, News but, says that. But, uh, but we don't... We, we, look, it's like have our newspapers. We would say our newspapers are too, as fair as they can possibly be, but they do have editorials with viewpoints very often which politicians don't like. They're often labelled editorial or comment. Do you think people who switch on Fox News know when they're getting news oh, and absolutely. when they're getting opinion? Absolutely. There's the Glenn Beck show at 5 o'clock at night and there's the Hannity show at 9 o'clock uh, where Hannity is very clearly you know, a, a, a pretty academic, conservative type of person but very articulate and enormously popular. These guys, incidentally, although they're seen in Fox News, they have radio programs in the morning and all over the place. Mm. The that Glenn Beck you that uh, are not ours in which uh, they just have huge audiences. The Glenn Beck who you mentioned has is, is called Barack Obama a racist and he helped organise a protest against him. Uh, others on Fox have likened him to yeah. Stalin. Is that defensive? No, no, not Stalin, I don't think. Uh, I don't know who they had. Not, not one of our people. Uh, on the racist thing, that caused a great thing, but he did make a very racist comment uh, about you know, blacks and whites and so on, and which he said in his campaign he would be completely above. And uh, you know, it was something which perhaps shouldn't have been said about the president, but if you actually assess what he was talking about, he was right. How do you think Barack Obama's going? Badly. Uh, and we saw it yesterday. In, independent voters, uh, where they had a chance in America, which was Virginia and New Jersey, in, all exit polls showed that independent voters, almost to man, changed sides and voted uh, anti-Democrat. There's great worry there. There's a lot of unemployment, business is very bad, and the Congress, and it would seem that the administration uh, is somewhat anti-business. So you're not going to get people starting new businesses or expanding while you've got this atmosphere. But he now, has... now it's a perception. I'm not saying it's a correct perception, mm -hmm. but it is a general perception which in itself becomes a fact and has a huge influence on the ability of the economy to recover. But he has had an extraordinary situation to deal with, the, uh, the global recession. Uh, and an outcry for better regulation of markets. Do you think he's mishandled this global recession? He hasn't brought in any regulations yet. There's been a lot of talk about them and a lot of backing away from them. And I think that, you know, in some areas the regulations do need to be changed. Um, 
and we'll see what they come up with. Um, the uh, has he handled it right? No. I mean, it was Bush and him. It was a bipartisan thing in the last weeks of the Bush administration, which put in uh, the money to sort of save the banking system. Um, and principle, I'd say, was wrong, but probably in practice it was right. It had to be done because we were facing a real collapse. Um, what do you see now for the global economy? Are we out of the woods, in your view? Well, I, I no, uh, we, briefly, uh, I think Australia is in great shape compared to America and uh, Britain, and I think you've got to enter Europe. But outside of those places, and outside of Japan, you know, the amount of wealth that's been created in the last year in the world, in places like Brazil and Southeast Asia, India, absolutely unprecedented in the history of the world. Uh, yeah, the whole world's not coming to pieces. Uh, but we do have an, a real problem in the biggest economy in the world. What started it? A housing crisis. Uh, I think it started years ago when the Congress started saying, setting up organizations to lend money uh, to what they call low-income ownership of housing. They were lending money to people who really should have been renting. Um, and that, of course, and then we had the Federal Reserve, uh, you can blame, and it's a totally independent organization, keeping interest rates low and keeping printing money and make, having easy money policy for far too long, and that fed a huge housing boom. Uh, have the lessons been learned from all of bubble, which had to be pricked, which, sure enough, was pricked in the end, mm. and and uh, you know everything came down because people were holding bad mortgages. Uh, it had led to a lot of abuses on Wall Street. There was just so much money around. Um, so, um, have the lessons been learned from that? No. Well, they think you need more regulations, or you need more this, or more that. Uh, I think you know the the, the Fed, the, the central bank made a mistake. Interestingly, one which is being absolutely avoided in this country at the moment. They're putting interest rates up very slowly in order to see that we don't have a housing boom mm. uh, and that money doesn't get sucked out of the system into unproductive housing, which should be in the working in the economy. I think what the Reserve Bank of Australia, if you think, is absolutely right. Well, it, it does, as you say, point out that the Australian economy is in a very different position to the rest of the world, that uh, we are doing well. How much credit do you give to Kevin Rudd uh, for that, and how do you think he is going as Prime Minister? Oh, I don't think Kevin Rudd's got anything to do with the commodity markets in Asia. Um, we're, we're lucky. We're here. We're in the bottom of Southeast Asia, the fastest growing part of the world, and We've got commodities which they need. And that's why we've done so well. And that's why we've done so well. Now, the price of those commodities has come down a bit, and people are saying shock horror, but in fact, they're still way above what they were five years ago. But he also spent a lot on stimulus. He handed out a lot of money and put money into infrastructure. Yes, I would be doubtful uh, about a lot of that. I think the idea that um, was it necessary? I don't know. I think hey, leave the system alone. Um, and um, <coughs> but um, some sudden stimulus, we were not about to collapse. Uh, I thought we were trying to you know, copy the rest of the world a little unnecessarily, but it's all right. You've done. I it. mean, the, look, Howard or Costello or whoever left the the, the, the national finances in fantastically good shape. And 30 or 40 billion dollars going to a stimulus package is neither here nor there, so that's fine. You've known, we, we can afford that. You've known a lot of Australian Prime Ministers. How does Kevin Rudd compare? Um, he's different in that he's more ambitious to lead the world than to lead Australia. Um, 
I said, a little bit of unfair crack, but there's some <laughs> truth in it. Um, he is a uh, very able uh, man. Um, you know, I didn't know what I read. When I meet him, he's very intelligent, very interesting. Um, when I read the papers, um, you hear this criticism that he's micromanaging everything, mm. and uh, he's also had a go at the, the uh, public. The mood will change. He doesn't like criticism. Look, look, he, that's he's nothing. had a go at the Australian as well, hasn't every he? Every prime minister, every politician, I don't care what country, where they are, who they are, they're all paranoid about the press or criticism. Generally, you know, they don't. They let things pass on the air and so on. But if they see an editorial which may, they may be one of the few readers of, and it's critical, uh, they waste a lot of their day worrying and fretting about it. Uh, they'd be better not to read them um, but is this, and, and get on with running the country. Is this Prime Minister more thin-skinned than the others you've seen? Uh, mm, yes, in that he uh, expresses uh, his uh, complaints more vociferously and faster, but no, I think they're, they're all pretty much the same. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. Back with more from Rupert Murdoch in a moment. We're watching every move our leaders make seven days a week. Sky News Agenda. Welcome back. We're talking to Rupert Murdoch. You have some strong views about the future of Australia and you laid them out in your Boyer lectures earlier this year. You talked about the need for a greater effort on reconciliation, reform of the education system, uh, reducing welfare dependency and the need for a, a liberal immigration system. Now on immigration in particular you said, and I quote, Australians shouldn't worry because other people want to come to our shores. The day to worry is when immigrants are no longer attracted here. Are you saying that this applies when it comes to asylum seekers as well, that we should be more welcoming? I think so, yes. I think we're a little over-conscious about this. Uh, look, um, I don't know, most asylum seekers are, are fine. We've got to just check who's coming in. You know, there are problems of, uh, uh, of extremist Muslims being placed in different parts of the world. That doesn't mean to say that all Muslims or that even 99% of them uh, shouldn't be welcomed and assimilated. Uh, <clears throat> um, no, I think you know, a mixture of people uh, with different backgrounds and come together, it's fine. Now, it, it meets with resistance naturally from uh, old-fashioned Australians, if you like, um, who uh, are used to a very, very heterogeneous society. But I think, you know, to mix people up, you're going to get more creativity, more business formation. Uh, it'll be fine. It's always difficult, the first generation, but you could just give it time. It's, look at America. A couple of other issues. It's 10 years since the Republic referendum here in Australia. Um, you've supported the Republic in the past. Are you surprised it's taken 10 years and we're still not any closer? I think people have concluded that it doesn't really matter much. Uh, but in principle, yes, I'm still for a republic. Climate change? Is the, are the world leaders doing enough on climate change? I think the danger is they might do too much. Um, we don't know enough about it. I'm total environmentalist. I'd like to see uh, <clears throat> you know, the rivers and the oceans cleaned up, the air cleaned. But we don't really know what is fouling the air except for dirty coal. Um, Do you support emissions trading schemes in general? I don't know enough about them. All I know is that whereas it was a matter almost of universal religion a year ago, now uh, it, it, it is possible to listen to very interesting intellectual debate on both sides of this and what should be done or not done at all. Um, but I don't believe that Australia trying to be first in the world with cap and trade or something 
which is going to cost people a lot of money, um, is going to have any influence on the rest of the world. China is going to look at us uh, and say, oh, so what? You know, I mean, well, we don't matter that much. Just be honest with ourselves. When you talk about what Australia should or shouldn't be doing, can you understand a lot of Australians might think, well, hang on, this guy ditched his Australian citizenship and became an American. Why, why should we listen to him? Well, they don't have to. That's fine. That's <laughs> Let me the, ask you about that change, though. Was uh, it, was I it don't difficult know why. to do? They don't have to listen to me, I'm, I'm, but I'm always asking my opinion when I'm here. Was it, was it difficult to give up your Australian citizenship? Yeah, very. Mm. Um, and um, You still think of yourself as an Australian? And since then, you know, it's become possible to have dual citizenship mm. here. Uh, but not in the U.S. But not in the U.S., although millions of people do. Uh, but I don't want to go before a congressional committee and be reminded of what I swore and, 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 you know, and admit that I've got two or three passports. Do you still uh, feel at heart an Australian? Yeah, yeah, very, very largely. But, you know, there's not much difference between America and Australia. Huh? They've had 200 years more history. Uh, it's not like China that's had 4,000 years more history. Uh, we have a very similar outlook. Uh, and, you know, it was um, interesting in the Australian American Association over there, they said, we must do more about getting understanding. And I said, you don't have to worry about what Americans think of Australians. They've got a very good, friendly attitude to Australia. The problem is a minority in Australia um, that is sort of knee-jerk anti-American. Uh, and that's why we support it very heavily, this uh, setting up of a study centre at Sydney University. Hmm. I want to ask you about your political influence. There's a great perception that you pull the strings on what candidates your papers support, <laughs> on what line they take. How much of a role do you play? Oh, uh, not as much as you'd think. Uh, certainly, I love to talk to the editors about things, um, and they don't always follow my what I say. But you know, really, if you, if you but, said, but uh, I basically choose the editors. I'll admit. Well, this is the uh, point. But I never fired an editor for disagreeing right. with me on politics. But does it happen if you say I think we should be backing uh, John McCain, or I think we should be backing Kevin Rudd? Will they ignore that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, the um, <clears throat> well, I mean things happen. I mean, I the editors in a, in uh, in, uh, in Britain, for instance, have turned very much anti Gordon Brown, mm. who's a friend of mine. And I regret it. Um, so you don't support your papers on that? Or? No, I think they're probably right that he's been a disappointment as a Prime Minister, he's been an unlucky man. But you know, at the end of 13 years of one party rule, the idea of, of change is probably good. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I like to be involved in these discussions if they'll let me. Uh, and, it obviously, uh, uh, it's obviously something politics that, that you're passionate about and very in, interested in. And have been for a while. Is that one well, of? I'm interested in public policy yeah. and yeah, and what sort of society we're building. We're, I mean, we're, we're right at the centre of all these things, and newspapers, uh, or television, or whatever, uh, has you know a great part to play in it. And uh, is that one of the reasons? I mean, a duck from it and say, oh, you know, that's why so many newspapers in America uh, have gone to hell, because you know third generation publishers. Uh, don't like to go to the country club and be abused about their newspaper. So they say, oh, we're not allowed to talk to the editors. You know, we don't talk to the editors. Nothing to do with us. Uh, and uh, journalists have gone off writing for themselves instead of for the public. Is this one of the uh, motivations that, that keeps you interested in what you do? Oh, sure. And 78, any thought of retirement? Or are you just going to nope. keep going and going? Oh. Of course I won't keep going and going. Um, when I start to lose it, I can assure you that uh, my kids will be tell telling me about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the kids, succession planning is always a difficult issue, it seems, for, uh, for family dynasties. 
what is going to happen if, if you did go under a bus? Well, the directors of News Corp will have to make that decision. Uh, but, uh, and they talk to me about it. They have a, you know, a committee. Uh, we talk every three or four months about it. Uh, but the family, which is now the Children's Trust, which the six kids are in, uh, and the, the, the four adult ones of them, um, will obviously, with 40% of the vote, uh, have a lot of say. And I, I'm sure one of them will emerge. Is that important for you? No, of course, but it's, it'd, be, it'd be nice. Yeah, every parent likes to see that. Lachlan, of we're, course. We're a very close family and... Uh, you were yeah. disappointed when Lachlan uh, stepped away. Yeah, and I hope he'll come back one Do day. Do you think he will? Um, I don't know, you'll have to ask him that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes. Final question, you're not done yet, obviously, but how would you like to be remembered? Oh, I think as someone who's uh, contributed to the world and tried to do, uh, to, to make the world more interesting and better uh, and use uh, the media uh, to good effect. Uh, and particularly to give the public choice. Uh, we've gone into competitive situations, we've subsidised competitive uh, newspapers and so, because we really believe in people having choice. Rupert Murdoch, thank you. Uh, right. Thank you.